Well, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Monica Oss and I am this Chief Executive Officer of Open Minds. And I'm so pleased you're attending my series of interviews with some of the industry's leading thought leaders. Today, I'm pleased to have Rusty Franz, the CEO of NextGen Healthcare join me. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with NextGen, they are a national leader in the EHR space, a very focused on the transformation of ambulatory care. They partner with medical, behavioral, and dental providers on a journey to value-based care and integration. Uh, what I do know about the NextGen platform is it really does go far beyond EHRs. It's focused on helping increase clinical productivity, enriching patient experience, and promoting, I think, that holy grail of whole person care that the country has been chasing for so very long. Um, Rusty is the fearless leader of NextGen Healthcare on their journey to better. Prior to leading NextGen, he spent eight years in increasingly responsible roles with CareFusion based in San Diego. Um, he, he served as the senior vice president and general manager of the global dispensing division um, and the transformational medication management strategy, strategy he developed across three of the country's global brands, created a billion dollars in global revenue and served as a strategic driver for the company. Um, previously, he also served as the VP of research and development for Pixis, something we all know and love well. Uh, he was the chief technology officer and co-founder of OutPurchase, a provider of cloud-based procurement solutions, and he started his career as one of the first employees at Omnicell. Uh, he holds a master's of science a degree in engineering from Stanford University and a bachelor of science degree in engineering from the Maine Maritime Academy, so from one coast to the other, Rusty. I want to I welcome you to our leadership retreat where we're talking, we've spent the day, we started the day with uh, Mark Mishik and Hazelden talking about kind of their journey in addiction treatment. Um, and, and you know, what's interesting in a great follow-up piece is, um, you know, when we talked before, we talked about next gen, your acquisition of Topaz, your commitment to the kind of whole person care and integrated care space. Uh, I'll ask you, the, you know, what a question I think is top of mind we certainly see payers, CMS, employers, their health plans who are working for them, moving and really uh, encouraging, let's put it that way, uh, the delivery system to take more of a whole person approach. You know, why is that from your perspective? You know, what, why this big push in the past 24 months on whole person care? Well, you know, it's been interesting having been in the role now for five years at NextGen and spending a lot of time in the field with a lot of clients, uh, really across all, all parts of ambulatory care. Um, but also being a person in the community who you know has family medical issues, as well as, <coughs> pardon me, as well as coughing issues, as well as issues really across the spectrum of health. And it's been an interesting journey as you start to see that the real goal is to treat a human being, right? Mm -hmm. Or prevent a person from becoming a patient or becoming a sicker patient, right? Um, unless we treat people holistically, and this has been proven in a lot of different settings across the industry, that treating people holistically when you are fully informed with their condition or you're fully informed with their, by their challenges and you can provide at the right time the right guidance or the right assistance to prevent it from becoming a bigger problem. And for so many years, we've looked at medical problems and behavioral problems. And then every once in a while, people go to the dentist. <laughs> and, and what we've realized is if you just optimize on that one dimension, yeah, you can help to fix that dimension, which may be a symptom of a cause rather than actually treating the cause itself. And unless you can see the whole person and truly understand the root cause that's creating either the opportunity for sickness or sickness, then it's really hard to cut things off of the pass. And then when you look at the cost of care, the cost of care shows it. And mm -hmm. so payers, payers are simply reacting to the fact that, that treating the whole person with a full view of the person from an information standpoint, 
um, with constant collaboration from a person actually delivers better outcomes and better outcomes to a pair mean more money or mm -hmm. profitability, right? Yeah. And, and so, you know, I see it kind of Darwinistically is the government does things ahead of time because it can, but when the pairs adopt it, it's because it works. Mm. And, and so that's kind of the way I see it. Certainly, you know, my eyes have been opened a lot. You know, it, it's been interesting to op to integrated care and really starting to look at how how much we've kind of lost the connection on whole person care, right? As we've kind of bifurcated mm -hmm. care pathways into entirely different systems and entirely different approaches. And so seeing that, seeing the reimbursement model and Senate being pulled back together, I think is a great win for the population. Well. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, the, I would say the provider community, if you think about the customers that NextGen and OpenMind share, you know, they, I think they see the value of integrated care for the consumers. You know, they understand the payer logistics, but they're really trying to work their way through how to make this happen. So maybe you could talk a little bit, if we move from the payer level to the provider level, so, the, you know, what should the CEO of a FQHC or a behavioral health, uh, mental health community, mental health center, you know, what should they be thinking about? What's the upside for them in the whole peer integration piece? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, I think especially in the federally qualified health center and behavioral health market, but also in the medical and dental market is folks are on the mission, right? I mean, their goal is not, is, isn't, isn't solely or oftentimes isn't really to optimize on the financial side. The financial side's there to expand the amount of care that can be given to a population with needs, right? And so, so when I think about it, from a mission standpoint, I think everybody's kind of aligned, but you have different challenges coming from different sides. You know, it's been interesting. Mm -hmm. It's been an interesting journey for our organization as you go to talk to clients who have clients, not patients. You go to talk to clients that are interested in understanding how we can provide both behavioral and medical, and, and, and on the FQHC side, the exact opposite thing, but these are challenging things to bring together. And so as a CEO, I think there's a number of things that you really have to think about. Number one is um, making sure that the personality of your organization is set up to be able to interact with a broader spectrum of people, right? I mean, it's it's just been interesting to me that it's 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 understanding how you actually deliver great results in a different tower of ambulatory, right? And that's not to be under undervalued, um, but also how do you create an integrated patient experience, right? bring these different care modalities together um how do you make sure that you're not you're not jumping into the deep end without knowing it and getting into some very difficult if you're going from behavioral medical getting into some very difficult specialties and some things with high reimbursement costs and mm -hmm. high reimbursement rates right and so there's there's a lot to bring it together but the most important thing is how do you provide this broader level of care to a, a broad population without driving your people into the ground? How do you make it efficient to actually provide this for your structure so you don't have 12 different processes depending on who walks in the door? Mm. And so I think these are all challenges. I think another challenge that's under, maybe under seen yet, um, under encountered yet is, and I, I wouldn't call myself a clinical expert by any means, but it is challenging, I think, to provide either behavioral, behavioral or medical or dental services if you don't understand the full care history of the person that you're talking to, right? And they may not even understand their full care history themselves. And so that's where another piece is that as we're moving towards integrated care, having a truly integrated view of the client and the patient I think those things become so important because otherwise, heck, you may not know which medication regimen somebody's on. They may not know it either, right? And so I think it's really important as well that as you look to expand care, you also look to expand the amount of information you're putting efficiently at the caregiver's fingertips 
to enable them to deliver a more holistic pathway for the person sitting across from them. Hmm. Well, you, you've touched on two, two issues. I know it's a little bit off script here, but you've touched on two issues both the payment reform part and the question of interoperability and aggregating all of the patient information for the consumer. Now, as you look ahead, where do you see those two issues, the you know, interoperability and payment reform headed? Do you, I mean, on a steady path, on a, you know, across the board, you know, kind of where, where do you see this piece going? Yeah, I mean, from a payment reform standpoint, um, first of all, I'd have to have a crystal ball right now because that's why we was why I wanted to ask you. The, the, the range of outcomes is 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 just so wide. But what I will say is, look, there's continuing through all the noise, there's continuing bipartisan support for more outcomes-based reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, there's continued bipartisan support for the fact that behavioral health is a serious challenge that unknown to people apparently until a couple of years ago is a significant cause of cost on the medical side, right? I mean, I, I understand that most people in the behavioral health industry certainly knew that. For me, my one of my big journeys was actually listening to Linda Rosenberg and Patrick Kennedy speak at, uh, at an Oliver Wyman conference and having them talk about, uh, talk about how the fact that the most important body, organ in the body has a stigma around actually treating it, you know, and I'm like, wow, yeah, that's right, you know, and I mean, even for somebody like me who'd gone to therapy for six years to work on myself, um, it still really hadn't occurred to me, and so, you know, I, I, I think that, um, I think that the reimbursement models are going to continue to migrate to incent this because it works, hmm. and because it's the right thing. And do you see then the, um, the so the Fed, you think that the federal government will sort of continue their push for interoperability to support this whole transition? I think so. I mean, look, the reality is if you looked at one of the primary drivers of meaningful use under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act back in what, 2009? One of the mm -hmm. primary drivers was the intent to instrument a digital health infrastructure upon mm -hmm. which better insights and processes could be built. Now like many things it didn't quite work out the way we wanted it to right but so be it we're here now and now with things like the care quality framework what you're seeing is you're actually seeing real clinically supporting exchange of data and then with the 21st century cures act coming into place blocking data is going to start to have penalties associated with it and so step one right the basic level of maturity is actually just exchanging data and knowing that the data is actually for a single identified person, right? And that's all well and good, but then we've just got a bunch of data. And <laughs> data doesn't actually mean that we have better information that is relevant to our encounter on how to best treat. We're starting to get there. You know, I think um, if you look at the at the at some of the better players across the industry, they're actually starting to deliver meaningful insights based on foreign system data, based on that full view of the patient. Um, some vendors not quite as much, but mm -hmm. and, and some some providers are still not sharing data the way they need to. But we're miles away, beyond where we should where we should have where we would have been um, had this not really started to come to fruition. And so I, I I feel good about it. Our clients are really starting to see value from it, and I think that as you move into integrated care, it becomes just that much more important because there may be activities that have happened on a in a, from a different group of providers that you're completely unaware of. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the next, you know, to add fuel to the fire in terms of this integration discussion, um, we're now seeing health plans not only recognize that behavioral health is a huge issue in terms of driving healthcare costs, but sort of get on the social determinants bandwagon. You know, the housing, nutrition, you know, access to transportation, education, these things all contribute to healthcare costs. Um, you know, I think we're gonna see more payers uh, push providers to get involved in managing social determinants. What do you see as some of the opportunities and challenges of adding that to the integration mix that you're talking about? Well, look, I mean, well, first of all, I mean, look, we're gonna, for a second, we'll set privacy aside. Okay. <laughs> we can come back to that. Um, 
I mean, zip codes are a poor proxy for social determinants of health, but they're, they've classic, kind of been the best thing we've got, right? That being said, they don't really identify food deserts. They don't really identify consumption patterns of individuals. They don't identify a lot of things that better help us target care, both preventative and responsive care, to patients in the right way, or frankly, to the community from a wellness standpoint. And so, you know, it's interesting, population health, people think of it as, um, as, as, as defining cohorts and figuring out gaps in care. I actually see it a little bit more broadly, which is popu a population health strategy allows you to take your most critical resource, which is your clinical provider workforce, and concentrate them on the patient population with the greatest need and the most impactability. But if the only thing you see is that they are a polychronic person, you don't know if they also don't have access to good food. You don't know if they don't have transportation. You don't know if, if, if. And so it's one thing to know that you need to perform a couple of tests. It's quite a different thing to understand how to truly engage them, both in their therapy and their medication adherence, how to make sure that they understand how to interact with the provider community in an efficient way along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, so, I think that social determinants has the opportunity to, to so much better hone our application of, of great care to the population where we get the most value out of it. You know, and, and so, so that to me, it's, 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 a, it's a further refinement of what we're doing and it allows us to get there faster and more effectively. Hmm. Well, you you mentioned uh, you used a phrase that you know piqued my interest. You talked about impactability, mm -hmm. um, and, and first maybe you could. Well, I have two questions. One of them is for our audience. Not everyone may be familiar with impactability. You know, kind of what is it? But the other is how do you see providers and payers using data to identify that impactability factor? Well, so impactability is a tough one, and I'm not sure we're really there yet. Um, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll use the NHS as an example of impactability because the NHS does broad studies on outcomes and determines whether application of, ca of, of extra expense can actually change the outcome rate in the population, right? And they do that. And look, it's, it's, it's got all kinds of philosophical questions around it, right? Because... Certainly, if I'm in something that they view as less, if I have something they view as less impactable, I'm not super happy with their impactability study. <laughs> right. right? Um, but back to the point, I mean, if you've got, if you have $100 to spend, you're going to spend it at the place where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. And bang for your buck in this case is not dollars of return. It's the best outcome for the community and the population but it's gotta be an outcome we can afford. And so impactability starts to become a really big question. You know, I mean, certainly in the last six years of life care, impactability is a huge question, mm. right? But it's, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a recovering engineer. I'm not ready to have a philosophical conversation about that. <laughs> but, I don't know. But, but I think social determinants also, um, impactability also is not necessarily something that is fixed. Impactability is also, it's a number that can be affected, right? Because impactability isn't just a function of somebody's clinical clinical condition or behavioral condition. It's a function of the treatment regimen that you can reliably get to them. And so I'd argue that social determinants also, going back to the last one, actually also improve impactability because you can better customize your care plan to the acceptable way that the target individual can consume it, right? It's it's a it's an experience that they can actually engage with. And yeah. well, it's interesting because you're echoing um, the recent um, cost benefit study of the Camden Initiative, which was mm -hmm. very much designed at outreach. And of course, when I, I read the report, in the end, the people that some of the reason that the financial results weren't everything they hoped was, I think, an impactability factor that 
people who didn't have a steady home, they couldn't catch up with them to essentially administer the treatment program. Right. And they sort of disappeared on and off the radar. So I, th I think your comment about impactability really is where everyone's at and trying to figure out what's in that. What does that look like and how do we use data to match people and services? I mean, it's, it's look, it's a really tough conversation because it's like a, it's a dose of cold water on the mission, mm -hmm. right? You've got a population out there that you want to be able to bring value from, but you've only got a certain amount of value to bring to everybody. And so you have to start making the tough decisions about where you can truly make a difference. Um, these are these are really difficult places to be in. Yeah. Well, and I see the work, the work that you're doing at NextGen, the whole piece of trying to integrate this together as an essential part of making social determinants work, because what, one, of, one of the things that we do see happening is people are coming up with new social deter, you know, social service programs without thinking about the right consumer group, the cost, the impact. And, and, I, and I do think that that, you know, that won't last long because I think payers will look at that and say, we can't afford you know, to invest in social services that don't have some measurable impact of some sort. Right. Yeah, the challenge is always in measurement, right? It is. Um, there's really different ways to measure things. And, um, you know, that being said, you know, I mean, having spent, spent, spent some time, you know, both in, in behavioral health organizations as well as FQHCs, um, it's, it's, the good news is, is it's a part of the market that doesn't operate maybe as much on the ROI. Mm-hmm other parts of the market right i mean you know no money no mission right so i mean you have to be financially effective and this is where i see this move to integrated care also having risk in it because as you add more service lines you have the you have the opportunity to provide holistic care you also have the opportunity to provide highly expensive highly fragmented care yes right and so you know part of the challenge especially is we've talked to some folks that are you know expanding across state lines that are looking to deliver multiple different medical lines along with behavioral um, that have an oral health business as well um, the challenge is is having that really consolidated view of the entire organization and then also you know what you can't measure you can't improve right it's having that measurement framework that allows allows mm -hmm. these organizations to expand in a way that is self-sustaining rather than getting too far out over their skis and, and finding the finding a significant shortfall in funding in a world that's already tough to find funding. <laughs> well, that that brings up an interesting question, and I'm glad you're the thought leader, so you can answer this. You know, the unanswerable. That's but, overstated, but go ahead. But uh, but you know, this whole push for in, for integration and whole person care. So, what are the measures that a payer would use to know that their investment in integration is working? And then the, from the flip side, if you're the provider that you just talked about, the provider that's looking at expanding and doing it, you know, how, how, what are their measures? How, how, do, how do executives sort of get their arms around, is our push to integration working? So like, I, I really can't comment on the mind of the payers or the financials of the payers, but what I will say is um, payers will also oftentimes go a ways down a path before they really see direct benefit from it, especially if it's a relatively small percentage of their overall footprint. But they, you know, I mean, look, folks have watched on the payer side, they've watched Medicare Advantage come out of nowhere. That's true. Right, and so all of a sudden, here comes this whole new model. And then you see concierge care for Medicaid in parts of Florida, and you're seeing, I mean, you're actually, to some degree, the great thing about this is is that it's 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 true innovation, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, folks, folks ask us, um, how are you working to deliver integrated care? And my answer is, we're actually working to enable the innovation of the people who mm -hmm. deliver integrated care. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and and you know, I, I think I think right now what you're seeing is you're seeing a tremendous amount of innovation around it. On the payer side, you know, I mean, look, they are looking at, you know, they've got armies of actuarials looking at long term long-term performance of different types of approaches to different sets of patients on the provider side on the other hand um it's it's when when we look at metrics we do look at metrics like are we seeing significant revisit rates 
are we seeing um, people start to use not just in-person visits, but telemedicine and not as a response to COVID, but more steady state and not just between, you know, it, it's interesting. I'd say probably about 15% of our, of our virtual visits are behavioral health visits. Wow. Yeah, um, I can say that because I said it on a public earnings call, so it's out <laughs> there. To, you know. um, but, you know, and, and so that was as of the quarter before last, just to be clear. Hmm. Um, but uh, but no, um, no, I mean, that's about 15% because, look, the interesting thing is um, our in-person visits have gone away, but behavioral problems haven't. And in yeah. fact, if anything, this is a ten tremendous pressure point. And look, I've got a 15-year-old, right? Uh, um, mm -hmm. I mean, managing through that, right, when there's – and they, they don't have really interaction at school. They don't have interaction with their guidance counselors, you know, and he's a pretty straight arrow. But, I mean, you know, these are – these are all big challenges that are out there. And so, you know, as, I've, as I, if I'm thinking about what to measure, it really comes down to, am I getting great patient engagement? Do I have satisfied providers? Mm -hmm. And is my provider throughput good? But also, you know, the thing I'd really focus on and go into integrated care is I'd actually focus on my process framework, oh. broadly for my organization and say, how many common processes do I have? Because heaven forbid this thing scales, and I've got chaos. Mm. Well, there you've touched on a very critical point. If I could just take a little segue and ask your opinion. How, how do you, you're working with so many provider organizations as we are, and I see them not having many common processes. In fact, sometimes I see them as not having any processes. It's more like an art practice than a production process. You know, how, how do you how do you advise your clients? How do people get their arms around that very issue? So generally the way we advise our clients is is actually first focus on the more of the back office process process framework. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And get good at get good at leading process change and user adoption in your organization. <laughs> with perhaps a part of the organization that is more likely to follow standard processes. Okay. Right. And so then you build, I mean, part of it's building a, cha a culture of change in your organization, right? So pick a couple of processes and streamline those before you take on your clinical processes. Are you saying that accountants would be more likely to follow directions than social workers? It's, I'm, I'm merely theorizing. Okay. I'm married to an accountant, so I can completely. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's it's also, you know, cut your teeth on something that's not right in front of a patient. Yeah. Because, look, I mean, the reality is going from a guild business to a more of a kind of a consistent process business is is a challenging change for everybody. But if you want to scale an integrated care framework and you have cats running in all different directions, it, it just won't scale. The patient experience won't be good. Your staff won't know how to support your clinical processes because it's different depending on who you're talking to, right? Mm -hmm. And and so so for me, that is that's that is so important when you're taking on new service lines. You know, I've watched, it's interesting, in the medical side, I watched private equity roll up a lot of single specialty practices. Mm -hmm. And you'd think they'd be way better at it than they are. Um, I wouldn't, but most people I think would. Um, but the reality is, is that they, everything works on a spreadsheet, but when you actually want to create true efficiency and a culture of efficiency and a culture of client focus, spreadsheets fall really, really short. And so what they do is they just basically buy a bunch of doctor's practices and say, well, now that they're all together, mm -hmm. it will be more valuable. That's mm -hmm. not the way it works. The way it works is you build a true great process framework and culture that enables you to add providers, add service lines into a culture that's already client focused and change aware and change capable. I mean, this is kind of a ways off the beaten track from behavioral health, but you know, it's no, I, to, no, to a large. I think it is the path to behavioral health because our opening keynote today, the theme was from someone in the behavioral health field that growth is a mission issue. And without growth, a lot of behavior, nonprofit behavioral health providers are going to fail. But to your point, how do you take an organization that's never really thought about scale and make them think about the scale they need to grow, which is what they need to survive next year? So I, 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 
a great- it's the, ultimate force, it's the ultimate way to multiply the impact of your people, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you already have people on the mission. How do you make them better able to affect the mission? You, you create an organization where the power of the organization can be wielded rather than just the power of the individuals, right? And I mean, that's a challenge, you know? I mean, look, NextGen was a pretty fragmented and very non-client focused place when I got here five and a half years ago. And we went on a long journey, but, but the first part of the journey was actually not painting bathrooms for clients. It was fixing the foundation and saying a lot of no's because we're not gonna say yes until we can actually deliver on yes. And, and I think, I think it's just very important to always be looking at what's my what what am I going to look like next year and how do I make sure that I'm building now the change ready organization to be ready for that. Yeah. Well, we it, you know we we bring I know we're out of time, but I want to ask one more question. Yeah. So this is our leadership retreat, and we are having three days of you know 650 execs thinking about leading things. So you know, what do you recommend? What as we look ahead and we need growth and we need change ready organizations and nimbleness, you know, what are the kind of leadership values and capabilities you, you think you know execs should be recruiting for? And what are you recruiting for at next gen? So the number one thing is intent. Hmm. Look, I mean, people can be falling short from a performance standpoint with the right intent, and maybe they're in the wrong job. People can misunderstand me going off in the wrong direction with the right intent, and that's a communication opportunity. But in either way, those are tactical fixes to, to just course correct great intent. If somebody's got the wrong intent, and I don't care how good they are, I don't care how smart they are, I don't care how amazingly charismatic they are, if they have the wrong intent, you're never gonna be able to look away. Hmm. So to me, the intent of the leadership team and the and the and the employee culture are absolute paramount. I mean, if you look, we were at a minus 53.5 net promoter score when I came in. We're at a plus 7.5 five years later. And interestingly enough, our employee survey saw the exact same rise one year earlier, over five over five yeah. years. And and it's just look, your organizational culture is going to determine how your clients feel about you and so that one's really important um but then the other thing is is look i i, I i'm directive when i need to be because the chips are down and we don't have time but most of the time it's really about my job is to enable a great team and a great organization to do great things and if they all just do what i tell them to do i guarantee we're going to go under the rocks tomorrow <laughs> so that's that's the other piece is is if you want to really if you want your organization to evolve, you can't do it yourself. You can only enable it to happen. So intent and servant leadership sound like your formula for success as we look at kind of the post-COVID era. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, look, I've been fortunate to work with some great leaders and in some really interesting companies and at all scale. I and mean, I started in OmniCell when I was a house of five people. Um, and, and so, you know, it's... Uh, and and I, and basically everything that I've seen truly work has had great intent and has been somebody who's going to enable greatness, not be great. Well, with that, I want to thank you, Rusty, for joining me for my thought leader series. You've given me big food for thought. I'm going to have to sleep on it and shoot you an email tomorrow. But I want to thank you for being both informative and inspiring. Well, thank you, and and thanks to everybody on the call for the work that you do. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's regardless of whether you're a next gen client or ever will be, uh, thank you very much because what you do is important for all of us. Great. Thank you and have a great day, Rusty. You all too. Bye now. Bye.